salty Gulf Coast To the rolling high plains To the piney woods in the east All across our dear Texas Folks need good food to eat Our farmers and ranchers are heroes They've always made Texas great Texas agriculture matters It's the heart of the Lone Star State Oh, Texas got it all, y'all Well, howdy, neighbors. I'm your Texas Agriculture Commissioner, Sid Miller. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Texas Agriculture Matters right here on RFD TV. Now today, we're gonna to talk about a unique craftsmanship that's been forging its way throughout history. While the artistry of bit and sperm making has been around for centuries, this timeless tradition continues to thrive. Long before the discovery of metal, historical records indicate that the first types of bits and bridles were created out of materials like bone, hardwood, hemp, and rope. Now, as the Bronze Age began, metal bits replaced their earlier materials and triggered a new era in horsemanship. Now, much like bits, spurs have been traced throughout history for centuries. In the early 14th century, spurs became widely popular and were worn as an emblem demoting personal rank. Now, the Spanish are often credited with introducing spurs to the Americas, and by the 1900s, the spurs we know today were brought to the western states by the Mexican vaqueros. As western expansion progressed and the American cowboy gained its fame, the cowboy's love for a flash of polished silver spurs spread near and far. Now, western craftsmen responded to the cowboy's desire by designing intricately engraved silver bits and spurs for the cowboys to display. Now, today you can find a pair of spurs in just about any Texas town you visit. So now let's join Tammy Arinder as she meets with Jeff Payne, the proud owner of Payne Bits and Spurs, who's been forging and crafting one-of-a-kind pieces for over 30 years. Now these remarkable pieces of art are just another way Texas agriculture matters. I just build spurs and bits and buckles, so I'm just a, hopefully a craftsman. Jeff Payne is a cattle rancher turned craftsman. Payne spends his days in his unair conditioned shop in Glen Rose, Texas, making functional pieces of art for cowboys and cowgirls. He spent much of his early adult life working on ranches, but when his wife gave him a pair of spurs made by Cowboy Hall of Fame spur maker Jerry Cates, that changed everything. Just start figuring, you know, working with it, doing this and that. And I would go up to Amarillo to see her family from time to time and stop and see Mr. Cates. And he would advise me and say, you know, maybe this way, maybe that way. So <clears throat> that's basically how I got started. Jerry Cates has helped a lot of guys build spurs. So with a few visits with Cates, Payne started creating customized spurs, bits, and belt buckles. I do mine a little different, and that's what makes me different than a lot of folks. The smart spur makers get all their stuff factory made. So they get 100 items that look exactly alike and then put them together. I do mine one at a time, by hand, the old-fashioned way with a cutting torch and a grinder, and nothing is pre-bought. It's gonna get almost red. So he painstakingly starts by heating up a piece of steel, then forcing it into the shape he desires. It's a process that takes elbow grease, a good eye, and patience. Even when the spur is made to specifications, there's usually some type of decoration that's added. Most spur makers would use some type of mechanized tool to cut their accoutrements, but not Jeff. He makes fine use of his hand tools. I cut all my own silver, I do all my engraving. Every bit of it is just done by me one at a time. So it's kind of the slowest, dumbest way you can build something, but you start with nothing and you end up with something that's a, a useful tool or someday you'll be a family heirloom. Payne says there are no two items exactly alike, and that's because they're made by human hands and not a machine. If my name's on it, I want it to be a quality product. So I try my very best, but because it's handmade, 
it's only going to be, I mean, there will be a few flaws in it, but I try to make them very functional. Jeff knows that what he makes are considered tools of the trade for those who make their living on horseback or even if it's just their hobby. But he also knows some will become part of the family. It doesn't eat, it's small, and so they're passed down from generation to generation. And that's what I like. But they're also useful, you know. It improves your horsemanship if you do it correctly. You have your very high tradable spurs and the pieces of art, absolutely pieces of art that people use a spur to make a piece of art. And then you have something like what I do and mine are, are used. They're supposed to be used. The harder you use them, the better they look. And I design them to be used hard, uh, the last. So mine are usable spurs and then you have your Spurs that you get at the feed store or something, kind of imported, a little cheaper quality, but mine are the ones that are used and uh, don't really have a lot of trading value, but they are used by cowboys, and that's what I prefer. I'm Tammy Orinder for Texas Agriculture Matters. Well, howdy, neighbors. Today, it's my pleasure to have my good friend, Gardy Alderson, with me. Now, he, Gardy is a legendary bit and spur maker. He's very well known for his craftsmanship. Gardy, thanks for being with us on, on the show today. Good to be here, Sid. Just to get us started, tell, us, tell our listeners about yourself a little bit. Well, I was born in Sheridan, Wyoming, uh, home of King Saddlery, closest hospital. Uh, we lived on a ranch about 60 miles north there in Montana, so grew up in Montana. And then went to Arizona when I was about 18. That blonde over there drug me down there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, started building bits and spurs out there. I was working for a guy. I was rodeoing. And I was working for a guy. He was making window guards and fence and all that stuff. So he let me start doing a little moonlight. And I'd always been interested in bits. And there was a big, a big barred copper mouthpiece bit that... I saw some guys, like J.D. Tadlock had one, a couple other guys, and I thought, man, I can make that, because we've all got this fascination with bits, right, whether sure. we understand them or we don't. And I thought, man, I bet I can make some of those. So I made about 10 or 12 bits. It's funny, the first, the first steel I used, I found in a container, and it was a throwaway, and I welded up 12 bits out of it, and I think 13 of them broke. <laughs> but anyways, anybody, everybody knew I was in the bit business, you know, I, I, but... Uh, I started moonlighting some there at that guy's place, and I took about a dozen bits to Denver one year in about 90, something like that, and sold them all just like that, and made another batch, took them to Fort Worth, and it paid for fees and fuel and everything, both trips, and then I, I quit that job and made a little shop out of a horse stall and started making bits. Good, good. That's, that's a great story. So your rodeo background obviously has, has helped you launch your career in the, in the bit making. How? How does that play into the picture? Well, the cool thing about it is when you're rodeoing, I mean, if you play, bas if you play basketball, you might know my Michael Jordan or whatever, all the big shots. So obviously rodeoing, and, and I came pretty close to making the finals one year. So a guy knows everybody on a first-name basis. And so if they wanted a custom bit made or something, well, they'd call me. And it's like if you're there and you don't have a horseshoe, you're going to use that guy standing over there. So I got to start making bits for, you know, Roy Cooper and – all the top guys in the whole rodeo industry from day one. And the trickle down from that, of course, is phenomenal. So all those rodeo connections, I mean, I've effectively made a living out of off a of rodeo my, my whole life. Now you've, you've actually made, made bits for me and a, a lot of people, and we've, we've got some of them here uh, with us today. So t tell us about your handiwork. We've got one here, it's got an RW on it. I, I assume that's Riley Webb, is that, that for the yeah, calf roper? Yeah, yeah, uh, Riley called me last fall and he's, Got his name down for a bit, and then the other day it was I come up on him, and I called him and I said, uh, you know, you want this bit? He said, I'd rather have a hackamore. So I made him a hackamore and got it shipped up there. And then I had a guy, and he's a big deal, and he's made finals over a dozen times in the team rope, and he ordered that bit right there. And, and uh, he drove by the house the other day, and he said he was too tired to pick it up. 
And so I said, well, I was tired when I made it. <laughs> so I called Riley and said, hey, you want this bid? I'll take so-and-so's initials off and put yours on it. He said, yeah. And that's the interesting bit, just in the fact that it's not exactly what Haven Medji wrote on that mare. It had a little bit different mouthpiece. His was twisted square. That's twisted copper. But that's a good gag bit. So I'm going to ship that up to Riley. And he's, I guess he's winning the world by a jillion dollars oh, right yeah. now. He's, he's way, good way, kid. Yeah, way, good out, way kid. out in front. Good kid. Uh, folks, we're going to have to take a, a break, but we'll be right back with more from Gordy Alderson and Texas Agriculture Matters. Stay tuned, folks. Welcome back, neighbors, to Texas Agriculture Matters. I'm your host, Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller. Now, let's continue our talk with the famous bit and spur maker, my friend, Gordy Alderson. Now, Gordy, you've got an interesting bit here. Uh, a lot of our viewers may, may not have seen a bit like this, so tell us a little bit about this uh, leather mouthpiece. You know, I've been making them for years, and then it got kind of popular. It's kind of the commonest thing you've ever seen, but it's just got a leather 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 strap in there for mouthpiece and it's it'd be a good introductory bit you know it's not there's nothing shocky about it and there's guys using them compete on them at, at pro rodeos on top notch horses or you can have it as a you know just kind of a starter bit but nothing shocky about it. if you got a horse kind of scared of their mouth throw that in there so go to what, what are some of the more your favorite pieces that you've made over the years well you know one of the one of the most favorite pieces i made was a pair of spurs and you got for Trump and you got them to him and that was that was really cool um you know one of the bits I really enjoy I don't really enjoy making them but they're kind of sentimental but a lot of times if a horse if somebody's horse dies I'll make something out of their shoes you know oh, wow. and, and I made a, I made a pair of spur I made a bit out of Louis shoes that horse Elisa Lockhart's and that went to a benefit and brought thousands of dollars you know wow. so Stuff like that. I made a bunch of stuff for George Strait and made a pair of spurs for Robert Duvall. Got to visit with them, you know, him on the phone. And, and then, of course, some of the, I mean, some of that stuff I made for Cody that, you, that he wrote on Pearl. Yeah. I'm talking about that was highlighted for many a year back at the old Thomas and Mac. I mean, you know, so, you know, when you make, like, there's many a night that the guys riding, you know, the bits and, bits and spurs we've made of, you know, they might win all three rounds in uh, either bits or spurs at, yeah. at, the, at the finals. And now, I, I don't mark it much. But did you, did you say you made bits or spurs for Robert Duvall and George Strait? Did I hear that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I tell you, what, I was really honored. You made that pair of spurs for President Trump mm -hmm. and asked me to present them to him. And I was riding in the back of the beast, you know, in his big armored limousine yeah. and presenting him those spurs. He was so appreciative. You know, and, and after that, we even had to get him a hat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so so he's got the hat and spurs. So, well, hopefully uh, he can wear them. Gordy Austin spurs. I don't know if yeah. he's ever wore them, but I bet he's got them on display. Yeah, he, might they'll, they'll strap, his, he might need to strap them on one of these days. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be in his presidential museum, yeah, I, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. So, you know, bit and spur making, it kind of has a legacy to it. And, and, and uh, uh, I don't see that many people coming along behind folks like yourself or, or Clapper or these guys, mm -hmm. how important is the legacy to a bit and spur making? Well, it's it's important, and there's there's guys coming along. Um, like I had, like a good customer of mine for years was a guy named Preston Williams. Another good customer of mine for years was a kid named Tristan Mahoney, and then a kid worked for him for a couple of years, Jesse Hoover. Well, all three of these guys now are are making bits and spurs, and I've kind of showed them all. And they're the key to those three guys is they're all good horsemen, and they're good guys, and and so. There's guys coming along, and then, of course, the guys that got everything going. I mean, there's guys like, you know, Kerry Kelly was so nice to me when I came out here to Texas, took me through his whole shop, and he's figured out how to make mass quantities and still maintain, you know, great, great quality. Tom Balding is a is – a, that guy has helped me so much, it, I can't even imagine. And then you got guys like Wilson Capron and Greg Darnell and uh, – 
I think, I don't know if I mentioned Troy Flayhardy, but there's a lot of great makers right here in Texas, you know, and there's, there's guys coming along, I do believe, and uh, it's, it's good to see. It's good to see there's room out there for all of us, you know, and I mean, if you go down there to, if you go down there to Teskey's, buddy, they got them hanging on the wall. Oh, there's yeah. got old Bryce Burdick in there. He's got, I mean, they've got more stuff. There's room for all of us, and they, they're still selling. You know, you kind of touched on something very interesting there. It's, it's kind of the cowboy way. All of your competitors are your friends, and y'all help each other. It's, yeah. kind, of, it's kind of like rodeo, isn't it? It's, it's, like, it's, it's yeah, just a those, unique yeah, family. You watch those guys in the Bulldog yeah. and the Calf Rope, and they're winning you, first. They're in there you probably the sell all the or, bits you can make. I mean, you probably have oh, a waiting yeah. list, and you know, yeah, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a year behind. Every now and then something will come up, and I sneak somebody in because they're a good customer. I got guys like Justin Martin and Ed Bowler. They've been with me for 30 years yeah. if they need something, you know. But And then there's so many people that – there's a lot of people that want a bit, and then I got a lot of people that really need a bit. But I'm so stinking far behind, so if you can't okay. wait, don't call. Okay. Well, we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. This, this has been great. I could talk bit and spurs all day long, yeah. Gordy. So could I. <laughs> I know you could too. Yeah. <laughs> but the last question, what, why do you think – Texas agriculture matters. Well, I think it's about a hundred billion towards the U.S. economy, and I I think about one in every seven people uh, jobs in Texas is in the That's ag true. industry, and ultimately it's like WTF, WTF. Where is the food without the farmer? So I think there's a lot of people that aren't aware of what an important role agriculture plays in their life, but give them three days, and they'll 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 wake up. And Texas is obviously is huge in agriculture. I think what number one in cattle and calves, sheep and goats. Absolutely. And, yeah. And then number of farms. The only thing is, and God bless you for this whole show because I know the number of farms since the 30s is is at least half. And so they're they're making it tough. You know, one thing that we've been able to do as far as helping there is is. We've been able to put a lot of money back in business people's pockets. There's a thing out there called ERC, and it's Employee Retention Credit, and it's a chance for us. We've helped a number, of, I don't know how many sale barns in the state of Texas and people in the ag industry, basically a tax refund, because we all get the heck taxed out of us. Oh, absolutely. And it's a great way to put, put money back in business, uh, agriculture business people's pockets. And we've currently helped about, oh, I don't know, 100, 100 people probably recover between 15 and $30 million. Wow. And so that's been real, real gratifying because a lot of that money, we're putting it back into ag in Texas. That's great. That's great. Yep. If, if they're interested, they can just contact you and you'll get them more information. Yeah. I, Gordy, yeah. Th thanks for being with us. You're fantastic. Great friend. Great, great Texan. And uh, sure, enjoyed having you well, on the and, show and today. I know we got to go, but I just want to thank all my customers and guys like Joe Beaver and Fred Whitfield that have sent me so many customers through the year and my wife over there and my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you. Now, folks, let's take a look at another one of our great Go Texan partners. For over 20 years, the Texas Department of Agriculture's Go Texan program has helped promote products made right here in the Lone Star State. From boots to salsa, Go Texan members make the best stuff on earth. Now, friends, let's take a look at one of these fine Texas businesses and why they are Go Texan proud. Go Texan every day. Rogers Lumber Company is a fourth generation family sawmill located in Orange, Texas. We specialize in uh, pine dimensional timbers of various sizes and lengths. And we also do lumber, uh, poles, posts, chips, shavings, mulch, uh, the full forest product gamut. We buy logs from the local area. A 60 mile radius is usual for a sawmill to source logs from. Um, it's per, for East Texas and us in Orange, that's generally up to Jasper, uh, that area, or Woodville to the west. Orange has a long history in the lumber industry. There was a, a sawmill here, one of the largest sawmills in the south, um, Lutcher Moore Lumber Company was in Orange, and they floated logs down the Sabine River to to orange to to the sawmill here and they were one of the largest producers at that time 
So we buy logs from timber companies, uh, loggers, timber investment management organizations, timber buyers, and we, we purchase those logs uh, on a scale by the ton. Um, and we turn those logs into forest products. For us, our specialty is square timbers, uh, dimensional timbers that we sell into the treating facilities, treating industry, to be used in industrial construction projects. Predominantly, we are producing those larger, heavy timbers that are used for uh, bridges, beach house pilings, uh, bulkhead shoreline material, uh, a lot of use in, in uh, golf courses for uh, cart paths over the waterways, um, railroad bridges. There's still a lot of wooden bridges built on the East Coast uh, that, we, that we supply. Uh, as I said before, I'm the fourth generation in my family to, to operate the business here. My dad's still here, my grandfather's still here. Uh, my great-grandfather originally started the business uh, in Arkansas and moved to Texas in the 60s. And uh, so it's family, it's tradition, and it's a great industry to be a part of. The statistics show that we're planting trees at a greater rate that we're, than we are cutting them down. Um, that certainly wasn't all the case, uh, always the case back in the early 1900s, the process was a little different, but today forestry is sustainable and that's through the efforts of the Texas Forestry Association that started in 1914 and uh, really changed the, the minds of, of most of those in the forest sector uh, to a, a conservation organization. It was important for us to become a Go Texan member uh, because forestry is agriculture. And once we found out about the Go Texan program, uh, we wanted to be supportive of, of that and all things agriculture in Texas. Go Texan every day. Well, neighbors, thank you for joining us for another episode of Texas Agriculture Matters. I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about bits and spur making and the artisans who've helped shape our American cowboy culture. Over the last couple of decades, the design of bits and spurs have come a long way. The hands behind present day bits and spur making have a more extensive knowledge about the horse anatomy and metalworking and allowing for a variety of designs and custom pieces. If you ask me, every cowboy and cowgirl needs a handmade bit and set of spurs hanging in the tack room, at least one. Hey, it's even better when they're made right here in the Lone Star State by guys like Jeff Payne or Gordy Alderson. As always, I'd like to close by saying thanks to every Texas farmer and rancher who works from sunrise to sunset to help keep our rural heritage alive. Finally, here's today's cowboy logic. To thrive in life, you need three bones. You need a wishbone, a backbone, and of course, a funny bone. <laughs> Thank you and God bless. And remember friends, Texas agriculture matters.